Here's what's coming up on your horizon. Well, there's any number of old axioms that describe the current state of our nation's ag economy. What goes up must come down. What goes around comes around. Or this one from one of my favorite ag economists. The cure for high prices? Well, it's high prices. All tried and true statements that our nation's farmers and ranchers are experiencing firsthand this year. Today, our focus is on our state's ag markets and how they fit into the broader national and global economy. What nobody really did expect was how dramatically we would see prices adjust. So we're, we're seeing prices now that are, gee, 40, 40 to 45 percent lower than they were this time last year. You're looking at, oh, a 40 to 45 dollar per acre loss on wheat given current market conditions. That obviously has a ripple effect, especially in our rural communities, areas that rely heavily on the agricultural industry. And we'll end our day down on the farm with a couple of brothers who will restore your faith in the future of farming. Stay with us for Oklahoma Horizon. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by CareerTech, a job for every Oklahoman and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry. Hello everyone, thanks for joining us here on Horizon. I'm Ron McClinton. Well, here's the bad news. Net farm income is down by 42% since 2013, and it's set to decline another 11.5% this year. But if there is a silver lining to this dark cloud, this comes following a boom time for farmers and ranchers when prices, well, they hit historic highs. But that's not much solace when you lose as much farm equity in two years as you gained in the previous four. Every fall, Oklahoma State's Ag Economics Department sponsors an annual Rural Economic Outlook Conference, and that's where our Austin Moore starts us off. There has always been a romance associated with agriculture. The farmer in his field, the rancher on the range, each harnessing the soil and the rain to feed a hungry world. But this year, the bloom is certainly off the rows. Farm incomes across the United States and here in Oklahoma are projected to be down dramatically. We've seen commodity prices across the board, both grains and livestock, uh, under a lot of pressure, uh, and that of course is, is impacting our net farm income. Rodney Jones is an agricultural economist at Oklahoma State University. He recently joined fellow economist Kim Anderson and Daryl Peel at OSU's Rural Outlook Conference. To better understand this drop in income, we first look at cattle with Peel. We had this phenomenal run up in prices from 2013 into 2015. Uh, we peaked and we expected, and we expected even that we'd probably gone a little too far. What nobody really did expect was how dramatically we would see prices adjust. So we're, we're seeing prices now that are, gee, 40, 40 to 45 percent lower than they were this time last year. And Anderson tells us the situation is equally upside down for wheat farmers, where a surplus of wheat worldwide has left our local numbers in the red. Uh, you look forward to the cost of production, somewhere around $170 an acre. Uh, the break-even price up into the uh, $4.80 range. And the market's offering $3.60 right now. So you're looking at, oh, a 40 to $45 per acre loss on wheat, given current market conditions. Leaving farmers with the complicated analysis of managing for loss, meaning some will have to spend money only to reduce the amount of money they eventually lose. So we got to look at the net return of each input on this wheat from now until we get it in the bin and harvest it. And as Jones reminds us, these impacts echo throughout rural communities. 
when we don't have money to spend replacing vehicles, replacing uh, uh, family living items, you know, buying consumable items for the home. That obviously has a ripple effect, especially in our rural communities, areas that rely heavily on the agricultural industry. So where will an upturn come? For grains, Anderson says, look to the skies. It's weather, and it's not weather in the United States, it's weather in the foreign production countries, so Russia, Ukraine, uh, the European Union, Australia, Argentina. What we're going to do, like we saw in 2010, where we got a $6 move in a six-month six time period, is we lost crops in the European Union, we lost them in former Soviet Union countries, we lost them in Argentina and Australia, and we got that $6 price move. You don't know when it's going to happen, and when it happens, you've got to have the wheat to sell then because you can't you can't wait till it happens and then grow the wheat. For cattle the path forward means weathering a different kind of storm. Most of the time we we talk about fundamentals and we talk about supply and demand and, and ultimately those factors are what's going to dominate where we end up. The path to get there can be dramatically altered by emotions in the market and particularly what has happened as a result of this dramatic adjustment down in prices is the, 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 the entire cattle complex is really operating in fear right now. It's scared, we're falling, it's much faster than we expected, we don't know where the bottom is and so we've got everybody panicked and, and fear sort of becomes self-sustaining. But fear leads to inaction, something Peel says is truly not sustainable. If you're in the cattle business or in the crop production business or any other business, you, you got to get off the sidelines. You can run for cover for a while, but sooner or later you got to get back in the game. So I think the question now is to, is to try to get people out of this paralyzing fear mode that they're in and get them to thinking about where's an opportunity here. Because in those opportunities, this rough patch can be left behind and a new chapter turned in this great American romance. Thank you, Austin. Now, one of the harsh realities of the global marketplace is for agriculture to turn around here, something bad is going to have to happen somewhere else because the only chance for higher prices is a shorter crop for somebody. A little later in our show, we look at the future of farming through the eyes of those who are making it their living. But when we return, the opportunities and vulnerabilities in the Chinese market. You're watching Oklahoma Horizon with Rob McClendon. Weekly insight into your changing world. A well, few economic sectors are more global than agriculture. Oklahoma exports more than a third of what it produces on the farm. But the global economy is a two-way street with goods and capital going both ways. And nowhere is that more true than with China. With the harsh political rhetoric this past year on the campaign trail, it's easy to view that country as a rival of the U.S. But some economists are looking behind the macro numbers and looking at what's really going on in this economic powerhouse. And what they see is an opportunity. Here's our Blaine Singletary. When talking about what's big in the global economy, there's one country you can't leave out. There's no doubt a lot going on in China, and I think that's why I spent 10 years there, because just the pace and movement of that economy and the people <clears throat> is, is unbelievable, and it's on a global scale. Brady Sidwell is the president of Enterprise Grain Company and also runs Sidwell Strategies and Sidwell Seed. Before coming back home to farm in Oklahoma, he spent years in China, right in the thick of that country's growing agriculture industry. We're actually a lot more similar to people in China than we both probably think, you know. And while China might have become something of a four-letter word on the campaign trail, well, okay, five letters, Sidwell says farmers should look at it as a potential big business opportunity and a relationship we should start fostering now. You know, I think relationships are very key in, in that market. All the students that we have here at Oklahoma State University uh, that are here from China and studying agriculture in China and being able to, you know, build those bridges at this point in time. This despite the fact that China's economic growth might be slowing down. It was booming in the mid-2000s with 14.2 GDP growth in fiscal year 2007. Ten years later, that slowed to 6.2. But according to Sidwell, it's not the numbers you should be focusing on, 
it's the people. The movement of people from the rural areas in China is moving into the middle class, which is magnitude of 27 million people every year. Um, these new consumers, that's really where the opportunity is. China has over one-fifth of the world's population, but only 7% of the world's arable land. That means there's huge demand for agricultural exports. The Chinese word for America is Mei Guo, which literally translates to beautiful country. And when you look at our vast open land, perfect for farming, it's easy to see why. We are good at production agriculture, and you know we're trying to find markets where we can have long-term uh, sustainable development and you know the Chinese are actually very fond of Americans and of this country and of the quality that we're able to produce. The Chinese consumer is developing a lot faster than Chinese agriculture is. It's a great export opportunity but one we have to move forward with cautiously. Chinese companies have bought out large stakes in Australian cattle companies for example and while they've been known to steal trade secrets they're way more than capable enough to buy them. You know, I think we do have to be careful. I mean, there's a lot of technology that, that we have here that um, allows us to be um, one of the most productive agriculture, you know, countries and states in the world. The relationship between the U.S. and China is a complex one, and it's likely to stay that way at a federal level. But perhaps the solution is right here at home. From a state-to-state -state level, uh, and company-to-company -company level, and student-to-student -student level, uh, within our state, uh, I think there's a lot of scope to be able to build relationships that, you know, will help us promote trade and business while, you know, of course, the national conversation continues to, to evolve. The key to a successful relationship with China is the same one for any relationship, recognizing the unique things each of us can bring to the table. In the end, I mean, do the Chinese want to take technology back to, the, to their country? Absolutely, they do. But one thing that they cannot replicate is, you know, our land and our resources and our work ethic and, and, and love for this business. Well, last week we told you how the rise in Chinese manufacturing has caused havoc with America's manufacturing economy. And if you'd like to learn more about the pros and cons of free trade, just look for that under our value added section at OKRISEN.com. Still to come on Oklahoma Horizon, the future of farming. I was more than excited, uh, you know, to, to receive the award. But first, the bigger picture. And I think that's kind of the reality of, of, of where the U.S. economy is at. Well, here in Oklahoma, we live in a land of big oil and big ag, two sectors of our economy whose rise and fall have in my lifetime been inextricably linked. If you will, take a look at this chart with me that goes all the way back to the 1960s. Now this blue line is energy, while the red, it's agriculture. And what you see is that both sectors, well, they stayed pretty depressed and pretty flat up and through the mid-1970s when both, well, they both started to tick up. Now, what seemed like a dramatic rise then was in fact pretty stable, even within the normal rises and falls you'll see in most cyclical markets. That is, until we got right here in the early 2000s when both agriculture and energy, well, those prices, they just shot through the roof. Agriculture, not quite as high as oil, but still at historic levels. And then here comes the financial crisis that started with our banks and then spread globally. And prices, well, they just nosedived and they've not been the same since. At this year's Rural Economic Outlook Conference, I sat down with the Senior Director of Industry Research for the Knowledge Exchange Division of CoBank, Terry Barr, and had him explain why many of the same factors that drove growth in the last decade have now reversed. So Terry, to understand our agricultural economy, we really need to look at the domestic economy and probably even more so the global economy. Where do we sit right now? Well, I think what we're, where we're sitting right now is we're seeing a, a great deal of softness on the global economy. The U.S. economy, from the consumer standpoint, is pretty resilient at this point. It's not outstanding, but it's pretty solid in terms of demand. Uh, the problem is on the global side, where we're just not seeing growth in demand. And, uh, you know, we're not seeing a collapse in demand. But as agriculture begins to expand production, as we're getting better yields, record yields, we're talking about record corn crops and so forth, uh, you need growing demand to absorb that. 
and, and we're just not seeing it. And I think that's the problem. When you look around the globe, you've got a lot of issues that probably suggest that we're not going to have a breakout on the demand side. Um, there's just too many, whether it's Brexit in Europe, whether it's elections in France and Germany, whether it's a restructuring the Chinese economy, all of those things don't suggest to me that you're really going to see this real breakout on the demand side. So now the question is, how quickly does the supply side adjust? Mother Nature gets to be the driver here. Uh, and that's, you know, ag doesn't completely control how much production is going to occur. And we saw that in the wheat industry where we cut acreage and still ended up with a record crop. So, so Mother Nature gets to be much more in control of the environment going forward because of the soft demand growth that's out there. Mm -hmm. And I really want to have you go back and talk to me just a bit about the Chinese economy where the growth has slowed considerably and also those developing nations, those, those BRIC countries. Well, again, when you look at China, you know, we used to talk about China, it was double digit growth. That was really kind of on and on. And now we're looking at an economy growing about 6%. Now, we'd love to have 6% growth in the U.S. But for them, that's half the growth rate that we had before. Their middle class is not rising as rapidly. That's really what drives demand for agricultural products, particularly on the animal protein side. That's just not materializing. They're trying to restructure their economy. They want an economy driven by the consumer, not by investment in state-owned enterprises uh, and exports. They realize that's, a, that's not a long-term optimum solution. So that's where they're going. They're not going to change that pattern. That's part of their 10-year plan. Uh, they're on a steady course. And so I think we have to expect that that's really what we're going to get. When you look at around the other countries, you, you, the, the BRIC terminology, we used to talk about Brazil, Russia, India, and China. Uh, these were the new catalysts for global growth and so forth. Now you look at those catalysts and you find a subdued China. You find Brazil in the second year of a recession uh, with you know, major structural issues that have to be dealt with. Uh, you look at India, pretty steady growth in India. There's not really been much deterioration in India, but it's not a very open economy. They don't really allow much access as far as agricultural products go, so they can't be the driver for us. And then you have Russia, which of course is imploding with regard to the energy prices. Uh, they're much more focused on uh, external activities on the military side than they are with regard to their economy. And so their economy has really collapsed, their currency has collapsed. Uh, not much optimism with regard to Russia, I think, in terms of going forward. So that doesn't leave us with much in terms of looking at uh, where are we going to find demand on the emerging markets. Uh, it's, it's a much softer situation than we would have thought two or three years ago. Uh, and I think what we're seeing is all of these countries have structural problems that they need to address and it's simply going to take time. Now let, let's pivot to the domestic market. I've heard the U.S. economy described as the tallest pygmy in that while we're doing better than everyone else, we're certainly not where we ought to be. Right, yeah, we're the best of the worst. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that's kind of the reality of, of, of where the U.S. economy is at. It's pretty solid from a consumer standpoint. Uh, it's pretty solid with regard to uh, uh, imports, uh, but if you look at the export sector, you look at business investment, it's pretty stagnant and so forth. And I think what we're looking at is a U.S. economy that is going to perform around the 2% level. Uh, that's really kind of the best we can hope for at this point in time, simply because we, like every other country, we have some major structural issues we need to address. Uh, in terms of immigration reform, in terms of health care, in terms of regulation, uh, in terms of tax policy, entitlement spending, all of those issues have been on the table for some time. That terminology, kicking the can down the road, we've been doing that now for four or eight years. Uh, we really have not come to any consensus politically or even I think among the American public with regard to where should we go with all these issues. Uh, until we can get that kind of leadership that takes us in some particular direction, I think we just kind of bump along at this 2% economy. So has that uncertainty, has it slowed our economic prospects? Oh, I think there's no doubt about it. And you can see that to some degree, we have pumped tremendous amount of liquidity into this economy, you know, with, a, with quantitative easing by the Federal Reserve, you know, balance sheets of these corporations are heavy with cash and so forth. Uh, there's a reason why this cash isn't getting deployed into new investments and so forth. And I think it's, it's this uncertainty with regard to the economic climate uh, and policy-wise 
that really limits the how much of that money is, is going to spent for new activity. Now we're seeing mergers, we're seeing stock buybacks, uh, we're seeing some overseas investment and so forth, but by and large we're not seeing the kind of things that creates jobs and gives us a dynamic economy and so forth. And I think we need to resolve these issues. One, you know, make a decision this is kind of the theme that I have. Make a decision on these issues. The business community knows what to do once you have programs in place and you've made decisions. But if you can't tell me what you're going to do with immigration reform, you can't tell me what you're going to do with regard to regulation, what you're going to do with regard to health care policies, I'm in a quandary from the business standpoint how to deploy my capital. Now, if you would like to see my full conversation with Terry Barr, just head to OKHorizon.com and look for it under our value added section. Horizon is at your fingertips. Join us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube to catch the segments you may have missed and our latest new content as it happens. Well, this has kind of been a show of old axioms. So here's another one for you. The apple does not fall far from the tree. And in the case of the Schneithman brothers, make that a couple of apples. When Tyler Schneithman crossed the stage at this year's National FFA Convention, he became only the 10th Oklahoman to win American Star Farmer, one of the most prestigious honors awarded to a student by the National FFA Organization. In FFA, uh, my involvement began in, in eighth grade and, and really kind of started out very small. Uh, started out with, with actually seven acres of, of wheat and it kind of developed a passion in me. and. Uh, from there, I, I, I was able to expand my operation over the years. Uh, FFA taught me a lot. Uh, taught me a lot about responsibility, uh, confidence, being able to stand up in front of a group of people. Something his brother Travis knows a bit about too. Travis won the national honor in 2008. First of all, I feel fortunate that we, we had the opportunity to, to be involved in FFA and agriculture education. Uh, it's really done a lot as far as uh, discipline, uh, record keeping uh, that we use every day on the farm. Travis and his brother Tyler are the fifth generation in their family to farm in Garber, Oklahoma, an agricultural legacy that they take seriously. We're a diversified farming operation, uh, crops and livestock, uh, crops mainly being wheat, canola, double crop soybeans, corn, milo, and alfalfa. And then we run a cow-calf operation uh, as well as uh, develop heifers. Uh, northern heifers and some of bread replacements. You know, I'll be the first to admit there are, there are times we have our, our disagreements, but uh, those are usually typically worked out uh, in a fairly timely manner and usually pretty easily. We use each other as a bouncing board, bounce ideas off each other, and, and uh, it's, it's been a great, we feel like we've been a great team. Uh, we, we get along really good for the most part. Uh, where we sometimes struggle with is, is convincing dad, you know, and a little bit older generations to adopt new technologies and, and why we should spend money on this and how it's going to benefit us. Uh, so a lot of times we're, we feel like we team up against, against dad, but, but he's, he's great to work with too. Uh, we wouldn't be here farming if it wasn't for him. A family of farmers with two brothers humbled by their own success. It's a great honor. Uh, there's a lot of people that, that went into making that happen. It just wasn't us. I was more than excited, uh, you know, to, to receive the award. But at the same time, I, I felt like there, there, you know, on stage really should have been a, several other people, you know, that, that probably should have been standing there with me, or, or maybe even more deserving. Now, Tyler is not the only Oklahoman to be awarded a national championship at the 2016 National FFA Convention, as they tend to do each year. Oklahoma FFA members came home with their hands full of awards. To see why the future of farming for the state is in some good hands, we have that full list of award winners on our website under this story. Want to see more stories like this? All our segments are streaming on our YouTube channel at Oklahoma Horizon TV. Next time on Oklahoma Horizon, we look at the connection between early childhood development and our workforce. Believe it or not, the skills gap starts even before kindergarten. We notice a difference in children as young as 18 months of age with the number of words that they know. Plus, we check in on the restoration at our state capitol on Oklahoma Show for the Heartland, Oklahoma Horizon. Well, that is going to wrap us up for today, but you can see more of any of our stories on our website at OKHorizon.com. Follow us throughout the week on Twitter at OKHorizonTV, or like us on Facebook, where we do post some weekly stories. 
Thanks for including us as part of your day. I'm Rob McClendon. Hope to see you back here next week. Oklahoma Horizon is made possible by the Oklahoma Department of Career and Technology Education. Oklahoma's Career Tech provides nationally recognized technical education. Career Tech elevates the economy, helping Oklahomans get great jobs. Career Tech connects thousands of qualified graduates with thriving Oklahoma businesses. Career Tech also gives Oklahoma companies training and services that help them become even more profitable. Oklahoma's Career Tech a job for every Oklahoman, and a workforce for every company. With additional support from the Oklahoma Department of Agriculture, Food, and Forestry.